All right, here we are, week 15 of the conference. Very happy to be welcoming um, this week, Eric Smith from Audacious. He's been a partner and collaborator with the BFA for, gosh, three or four years now at least, Eric, maybe maybe a little bit longer. And um, yeah, this is our uh, one week one week left after this, so penultimate, penultimate presentation. And uh, yeah, the general format is for those who are just signing on for the first time or haven't, <laughs> didn't read the directions, one hour of presentation followed by half an hour of Q&A with myself and other panelists, and then half an hour of Q&A um, from you, the audience. Feel free to put your comments to each other in the chat box and any questions you'd like Eric to address in the Q&A. All right. Um, do you have any any uh, anything you want to say to begin with, Eric? Or just t take it away. I'll let you, I'll let you let you let you go with go for it. Uh, I do have something I want to say. Uh, actually, I want to say happy birthday to <laughs> Dan. <laughs> True statement. Um, if I yeah. could flip everyone off uh, <laughs> uh, on on to camera, I would uh, let them all sing to you. But I don't think I have controls to do that. So uh, maybe yeah, we can all throw a happy birthday into the chat for Dan. Uh, yeah, another year around the sun, huh? 47, 47, yeah. <laughs> Closer to 60 than 30, I've been saying for a couple of years now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much. So happy to, happy to have you here on my birthday. Thank you, thank you for uh, <laughs> for coming to present at the conference. It worked out great. Um, and so yeah, Dan and I have been. Uh, I think it's. I think we're coming up on four years uh, of definitely of working yeah. together in different capacities. And so it's been uh, fun just kind of being on this journey together. And so it's uh, excited to show people what we're up to today and um, how the partnership is working and what we're all uh, working on. Great. Well, I'll I'll uh, I'll turn my camera off and let you let you let it rip for an hour, and then look look forward to the conversation. Uh, Shauna, uh, sharing feature. It should be enabled. Yep, there it is. She's got it. Uh, interesting. Let's make sure it's giving me unknown signs. All kinds of comments in the chat about age here. I'm not reading them. Old age starts at 80. Okay. 40 to new 30. Yes. <laughs> um, Shauna, I have to come right back in because I screwed up my system settings. Be right back. Dan, do you have any... Whoops. Any any comments or insights I want to offer at the moment? No, no. <laughs> I was thinking of, uh, on a birthday, just a, a reflective birthday note. Oh, he's back. Save by the bell. Okay. Save by save with the bell. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> you ready to go, Eric? Yeah. There we go. Perfect. All right. Take it away. Okay. Um, so hi everyone. Uh my name is Eric Smith. I am um the CEO of Audacious, and I'm really excited to kind of share my own journey uh, into the space and share what we've learned and what our company is working on, um, all of which we've um, been learning uh, out loud and in the market uh, with you all in different ways and different capacities. So um, today I'm going to talk about my own journey. We're going to talk about uh, some high-level systems questions that I think it's important for us to ask, given the context of this conference, which is, you know, the state of nutrient density um, and where we think that's going to go. Um, then we're going to show you, I'm going to show you the tools that we've built um, that will help unlock some of the opportunity in the space um, and what we're building on behalf of the Bionutrient Food Association uh, and the Bionutrient Institute to help report out uh, a lot of the data that the field is generating to help compare uh, the nutrient quality between different foods. Um, so um, I'm gonna jump right in. Um, I, how did I get here? Um, I've had a pretty interesting journey, but it all brought me to this question of nutrient density what is it? Is it a tool for systems change? And how can it be a lever for um, 
unifying and connecting the dots between agriculture and human health. Um, so I've been kind of at the intersection of natural resource management, uh, payment for ecosystem services, certification, economy, ecology for a long time. Um, but my core thesis in kind of working on climate and environmental systems has always been, uh, unfortunately, we live in a capitalistic society and we should use those tools to try and realign incentives and behavior change within our system. Um, and so I have been trying to identify uh, market-based incentives to get greater protection and greater facilitation of our natural resources. Um, and the journey from over the past 20, 25 years from one of uh, protecting that resource, the conservation movement, uh, to one of sustainability, one of sustaining uh, that natural resource base to one of regeneration uh, is emblematic of my own career and what has been happening uh, in our greater awareness of these systems that are possible now that we have the knowledge uh, to, to change them. And so um, just really interesting, I, I moved from like certification systems and where I was understanding how you go out into a natural resource system and say, is this being sustainably managed? Uh, and what you're looking for in terms of the ecological principles, the human, uh, the social principles, and the e economic principles that govern the management of a natural resource, and how that ended up being communicated to a consumer via certification systems. And I took a lot of that knowledge back into a formal education and really thought about, okay, how do I pair this metric-based systems, uh, metrics for accounting and, and tracking outcomes into alignment with uh, a capitalist-based systems. And so how do we move dollars and capital to systems, projects, people that align not only with our values, but with good economic value in terms of protecting and restoring our natural resource base. So that was a lot of like my guiding principles of how I got to this moment uh, and how I got to Audacious. Um, our relationship, uh, Dan and I's relationship really started uh, during my time at the Grantham Foundation. So the Grantham Foundation is um, uh, what we would call a, a, a mid-sized, very, a pretty large foundation in the scheme of things, but not a household name in terms of the reach and scale of some of the dollars that Rockefellers or MacArthur's or groups like that really have to work with. So it was really important that we were catalytic and engaging with the, that resource base to help move uh, the system forward. Um, but I was trained as a system thinker in that, in that role to really move both uh, catalytic grant money and catalytic investment money into projects to address global environmental degradation. Uh, and so our thesis was to find really great ideas and then get them moving and, and try and see if they could become a force in and of themselves. But we wouldn't stay with something for an indefinite amount of time. It was like activate, build a consensus, try and get partners and people working together, move dollars around and um, get movement started. Uh, and so we were really early, uh, I was responsible for building a portfolio called Neglected Climate Opportunities, which was a um, a nine figure venture portfolio. We were investing in early stage startups to help advance climate technologies further along their development curve. Um, and to tie this all together, it was a really interesting journey because I was investing in soil carbon, soil health systems, trying to identify levers by which to pay for those practices or those outcomes associated with uh, better land stewardship. Um, and so this is probably a bit of the language and a context that this crowd's not traditionally familiar with. I'm bringing a very much a commercial business uh, venture language into this space to try and identify solutions for the environmental crisis in which we're living. Um, and this is how I bumped into Dan, because I became um, pretty disenfranchised or, or nervous about the monetization and commercialization of many of the environmental attributes that we were attempting to monetize. So carbon sequestration, watershed services, biodiversity attributes. Uh, the challenge with a lot of these things is 
what is the value of nature? What is the 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 reason for monetizing this is we can put a price on it, put it on a balance sheet, uh, and then have someone properly account for stewarding those resources to increase their uh, ecological and economic base. The problem with that is as soon as you do that, you're conferring a value and that value might not be as high as the true value provided by nature. And we saw this um, in for those, this is going way back, but the National Fund for Financing Forestry uh, in Costa Rica that wrote the book on payment for ecosystem services, they created a hydrocarbon tax to then route that money to protect and restore forests based on a law that said, hey, we Costa Ricans value the ecological services provided by a forest. Water, carbon, biodiversity, scenic beauty, um, pharma, pharmacological, pharmacological benefits. Um, long story short, the, the, the money wasn't high enough to actually compensate for the difference that landowners could get in ripping that forest out and starting to graze cattle. And so you really started to see this market-based tension, even though they had systems to properly account for those ecosystem services, um, even though it's been a story of success and Costa Rica reversed all their deforestation. Anyways, all of this is the context in which I lived and grew as a professional over the past 20 years in searching for solutions to incentivize better behavior change on the land. Uh, and that's how I bumped into Dan, because Dan presented this idea, which was pretty simple, which is forget all this secondary stuff, water, biodiversity, um, carbon, just look at the food, let the food tell the story about what's happening on the land. And that became such an interesting question to me of what if you could look at the biochemistry of the food and it could tell you everything that you wanted to know about the food itself. And so that's how I got here was um, Dan sharing his wisdom, uh, the mission, the vision of the Bionutrient Food Association to really bring forth this idea that um, the food is the best connection we have between agriculture and human health. It's the best connection we have between the environment and ourselves. And it's the best connection we have between two systems that are in polycrisis, our global environment, the climate, uh, and, and local ecosystems, and what we're experiencing in our mind and our bodies. And if you can't see the relationship between these things, and we're just attacking these things without understanding that they're connected, we're never going to solve the problem. And so it was such an interesting experience for me where I had um, Jeremy Grantham, a, a storied financial investor who's a deep systems thinker, coaching and guiding me with a team to think about systems level solutions and recognizing that Dan was presenting one of the most compelling systems level solutions that I had seen in 20 years of thinking about environmental problems. Okay, switching gears a little bit. Um, nutrient density. Um, I... I'm concerned. <laughs> uh, Dan has set out to, um, you know, when we frame the beef study, we talk about defining nutrient density, and I think it is the right thing to do. Um, there are many ways to define nutrient density, and because there is no universally accepted definition today, it is now being blasted just about everywhere. I see it on packaged food companies. I see it on beef companies of all different types of beef production systems. I see it using uh, both processed and unprocessed food. Um, it, it, it hasn't even been flagged on the government's radar yet as something that's like, hmm, we need to worry about that one. Um, that being said, the reason for that is there's lots of different definitions. I chose three that I really liked here just to make a point, um, which is, there's lots of different ways to think about it. And as a movement, if we need to think about defining it, now's the time. Um, so academic, um, the guy who's probably most famous for developing some pretty compelling, easy to understand NPSs, nutritional profiling systems, is Adam Jernowski. And uh, I really like his systems. They're they're from, they're easy to understand. Um, and and Eric, much, Eric yeah. I just want to interrupt for one second. Are you moving your slides forward? Oh, yeah. If you are, we're not seeing it. Thanks for interrupting. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, okay. What do you see on your screen? Now we got it. Yep. Yep. Perfect. 
Is it is it filling up the whole screen for mm -hmm. you? Yep. Can you Adam see Bernowski, governmental general public? Okay, great. Yep. Uh, and how, what happens if I do that? Nothing. Nothing. We can we can see the slide. It just it was the most important thing was it sounded like you were referencing something. Okay, we'll just keep it here and we'll go there. So, um, okay, so um, from an academic perspective, um, and we've gone through this as we work with our data sets, the implications of defining something on a nutrient dense on a calorie basis, on a weight basis, or on a serving size basis change the outcomes. Uh, and that's really interesting because how you measure this stuff matters. Academically, there's lots of different ways to do this. The most common way is on a per calorie basis, um, but that has implications. We do both internally and we can talk through what that means. Um, government, government, for the record, the USDA, FDA, their definition is everything that is a whole food is nutrient dense. And that is provocative and that is worth discussing. The BFA and Dedacious subsequently uh, argue, no, you cannot call all food nutrient dense. If you have a one apple that has 10x the amount of nutrients than this apple, clearly you have to compare apples to apples and not just all whole foods. So, um, but as per USDA uh, dietary guidelines, sorry, FDA dietary guidelines, all whole foods are nutrient dense. Uh, and then general public, the there's some definitions out there of just like, it's the relationship between the nutrient, um, the abundance of nutrients that are beneficial relative to the abundance of anti-beneficial or the caloric output of the food. Internally, uh, we have not sought to define it. I will explain that. But what we talk about is it is the uh, relative abundance and diversity of health-giving compounds within the food. Um, and that's why we compare apples to apples and apples to oranges off um, on an individual nutrient basis is because we haven't sought to define nutrient density. Okay, um, just some provocative system level comments here, right? What is the goal of this movement? What are we trying to do? Um, Dan for years has defined that the goal of the BFA is to increase quality in the food supply. Um, it's a great, great goal, right? Increase quality. Um, well, we might need to be a little more um, outcome centric and think about my background again. What are we, how are we gonna know that we achieved an improvement in the quality, right? Um, we're getting a little more granular. There's a lot of conversation around taste and nutrition. Um, okay, can we measure taste and nutrition? Then the other part that I really wanna introduce is the sustainability argument. And this is one that <laughs> if we're gonna connect the dots between agriculture and human health, we need to understand metrics for sustainability and regeneration and whether or not we're producing that nutrition in a way that's in balance with the ecology in which it is produced, right? So um, I think it's important that we define metrics for success for the movement so that we can think about uh, the different ways to communicate that our movement is heading the right direction. Um, and like taste, right? Taste is pretty subjective. Can you quantify that the food is getting tastier? Okay. More nutritious? Yes. I think we can quantify changes in nutrition. And that's why you'll see Eric, systems level thinker, quantification, he's measuring, talking about changes in the nutritional uh, density of the food. Um, when we talk about nutrient, um, sustainable nutrition, this is really interesting because now we're talking about what is the relationship between um, nutrient density and greenhouse gases? Well, how do you put uh, life cycle analysis data with nutrition data so that you can tell a compelling story? Um, <laughs> not to kind of, well, to cut to the chase, the climate and environmental movement isn't going to like the fact that when you put greenhouse gas data side by side with nutrition data, the story is, is different. There is a much more compelling argument to be made for having livestock and livestock systems embedded in our agriculture systems 
And not everything can be plant-based because those animals are very good at delivering a lot of nutrition and a lot of nutrition that we need as humans. Uh, of course, then that depends on the context at which it's produced. And we've talked a lot and we'll go into that. Okay, let's keep it moving. <laughs> um, so the audacious view is that we need to build a system that incentivizes both quality and quantity um, and that we must consider accessibility as much as the nutritional quality of the food. Um, we're not going to address the human health side of this problem without uh, greater accessibility of nutritious whole foods. And that is something that the movement, I think, really needs to keep in mind is that um, accessibility is as much a problem as quality. Um, okay, again, real quick, um, what is the problem? Like, what are we actually trying to solve here? And I... I'm presenting this to you as like the journey that I went on the past two years to try and figure out what Audacious is and what Audacious needs to be doing to be successful as a company in this space. Um, so three kind of questions. Um, okay, the nutrient density is, of food is low. We know that. We can look at the studies. We can look at the change over time. Um, we have both empirical and anecdotal evidence and uh, empirical in the sense of observed observations of changes in the nutritional profiles of food alongside anecdotal. Ask a European or anyone from the old world or grandparents to come over here and taste American food today and they'll be like, why does this taste like shit, right? Anecdotal experience. Um, both of those things, whose problem is that and why is that a problem? That That's what I'm wrestling with, right? Who's going to pay to solve this problem, whose interest is this, right? So we have two sides of this equation. We have people who are losing out on both sides of the system. You have producers and you have consumers and or eaters. And both groups are simultaneously being disenfranchised by the middle of the market, which is incentivized by unit economics and scale. So our whole capitalistic system has forced these companies to get big uh, and drive on margins that have caused both groups to suffer as a result. Uh, what does that mean? As an eater, you get lower quality food at a higher price <laughs> today, but or objectively you're spending less and still getting the same uh, amount of uh, volume of food or caloric amount. And as producers, totally disenfranchised, right? If you're competing in a commodity market, you are suffering. That means you are a price taker, and you are searching and, and you are just going into the market and saying, hey, I've got X amount of bushels to sell. What's my price? Never want to be in that position. That is the position that we've left most of our farms in America in. And what that means is the middle of the market has exploited those relationships and those supply structures to get their business and the dollar, the profit margins concentrated in the middle of the market. So, um. Here, the message that I'm trying to convey is it's everybody's problem and nobody's problem. And if it's no, if it's everybody's problem, no one's going to solve it, right? And so we're de dealing with this complex system in which we are struggling to come up with mechanisms for systems change in which we can properly incentivize relationship structures on both sides of the market. Um, okay, so... Um, this, this other question that I really want to ask is like, are consumers struggling to purchase for health and quality? And I think this is important for us on this call and this movement to really think about, right? Because there's this issue of what you would call processed food versus whole foods. And there's a group of people that think that as long as you eat a abundance of unprocessed foods, nutritionally, you should be fine, you should be healthy. Um, and there's most of us, I think, on this call, and Dan and myself would agree that, like, that's not true. Like, even if you eat whole foods, you are not getting the optimum amount of nutrition that you need as a human, given the way that food is currently produced today. Um, and that's kind of what we have to explore. But I think it's a very important part of this debate that's happening and playing out in real time right now of what is the relationship between nutrient density, food is health, food is medicine, and what is the hierarchy of the problems that need to be solved to unlock these relationships? Um, um, 
David Lazax and um, Mandy, I forget her last name, wrote a paper a few years ago and they, they presented a continuum of uh, this food issue in terms of addressing these four levels of how to bring systems change. And so uh, uh, bringing about food as medicine, food as health. Level one was replacement. We need to stop getting people eating really crappy processed food. Level two was toxicity and pesticides. And we got to get all the toxicity out of the food system to be able to address human health. Level three was the nutritional quality or the nutrient density of the food in terms of how we can optimize human health. And level four was kind of this microbiome centric approach. Um, and we can throw that paper in the chat at some point, but I think it's a really good uh, foundational paper that kind of presented of like, what is, is there a hierarchy? What are the relationships between these factors? And I think if you think about our consumers struggling to purchase for health and quality, you have to think about the relationship between those four boxes um, because we know toxicity is way worse of a problem than we even think it is. And it's disrupting our hormonal systems and our internal operations in terms of how we can stay fit and healthy. We're not getting the nutrition we need. We're deficient, regardless of whether we eat a whole foods or an unprocessed diet. Um, and then level one, back to like the replacement theory, we're not eating fruits and vegetables because they taste like crap. Like, how are you going to incentivize people to eat more whole foods if they don't taste good? Right. So this then elevates the importance of that level three and start starting to talk about uh, and like, oh, and the point I want to make on level four, and this is like so early research and it's coming, but like things like bioavailability and cofactors and enzymatic processes matter in your microbiome if you're going to actually extract that nutrition from your gut. And people don't realize that. And you have the toxicity disrupting your gut. It doesn't matter how nutritious your food is because your gut's out of whack. So I don't like to think about these things like, like hierarchy. I like to think about these things as interconnected systems that need to be simultaneously addressed. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Here, here we are to talk about that. Okay, so I put my audacious hat on for a second and I'm saying, how do we bring this solution to the market? When I started audacious, I thought that this was just a measurement problem. I really thought that it was messy, unorganized, difficult to acquire raw nutrition data in a way that could help the market make better decisions. Uh, what I've now realized is that there's two problems. There's a measurement problem and there's a communication problem. Um, we're trying to tackle both of those problems and we'll talk through the ways that we're doing that. Um, but I really want to iterate that um, you need, we need to do both as a system, because even if I give you the data, what you do with it and how you story tell the quality of that food via the nutrition is a problem for everyone in the food system. Um, but we like to frame it as like, do you have accessible data? Do you, is the data accessible to you as a consumer, as a producer, as a food system to be able to compare uh, and, and market a higher nutritional quality food. Um, and so I think that's really important. And we're gonna talk about both of those things. Okay. Um, I think this is important just to like, give a sense of how this all happens today, right? So um, food is produced. Um, it is either sold as whole food or it is sold as a processed food or some level in the continuum in between. So things like animal products are processed foods because you get raw milk, you process it, you get processed milk, it gets sold on the shelf. Um, wheat, right? Rarely do we actually look at the nutritional composition of wheat because it gets processed, it gets milled, and it gets incorporated into final products or sold as milled wheat on the shelf. Um, fruits and vegetables, rarely ever, if all measured, Full stop. <laughs> um, so the amount of time that a food actually gets measured is very infrequent. And the reason for that is this lab bucket. The lab bucket is how we measure the nutritional composition of food, analytical chemistry. You send your food off to a service lab. A service lab runs it through lots of different assays. It runs through expensive machines called 
uh, gas chromatography, mass spectroscopy, or liquid chromatography, mass spectroscopy, or inductively coupled plasma mass spectroscopy. And through that process, which is very expensive, thousands of dollars per sample to generate a robust, robust nutritional profile, you get a certificate of analysis. And what you do with that certificate of analysis is you create a nutritional fat with that data is you create a nutritional facts panel, like it's left on your label. End of story. That's how most of the food system operates today, except it's even worse than that. The reason most people do the lab analysis is just for safety. So there's no proactive strategy to differentiate quality. And the truth is, if you're not a large corporation, you're likely relying on a generic nutritional database from something like Genesis uh, or even the USDA food composition database. What that means is you're taking generic inputs about your food type and putting them into uh, on your label if it's a whole food or in a processed food and formulating and generating a very new generic nutritional facts panel. And that's why if you go into the store and you hold start to do the comparisons, it all looks the same because they're all using the same calculators and they're rarely doing any testing. Oof. And the crazy part about this is like that nutritional facts panel, it's basically you can have up to 120% of what's listed if it is anti-beneficial, um, uh, sodium, um, trans fats, things that are considered negative for your health. And if it's a beneficial nutrient, you can have as low as 80% of what's listed on that. But that all presumes that someone's pulling your bag of something off the shelf to actually audit it and say, are you marketing the true nutritional value of your product? The fact is that almost never happens. As we know, the FDA is mostly far focused on the D and the D is mostly focused on drugs and supplements. And rarely does any type of food or whole foods actually get pulled off the shelf and audited unless it's being done by like some type of consumer wash group. Um, so the fact is this system, which is designed and supported by the FDA, and this is how it works, is not serving us and giving us accessible and true information about the nutritional quality of our products. Full stop. Not working. <laughs> um, the part of the problem is this bucket of the lab expense is very expensive. If you wanted to generate a complete nutritional profile for something like a ribeye, it would cost you between three to $4,000 for one sample. By that, I mean fats, fatty acids, protein, amino acids, vitamins, minerals, um, maybe some carotenoids. You're talking about $3,500 on average from a lab. What does that mean? Doesn't happen. FDA, USDA don't require it. Everybody relies on the databases or nutritional facts panel. All the data looks the same. So that is the state of why the data is hard to come by and why measurement is so challenged in the current context of the world in which we live. Okay, so what do we do at Audacious? Uh, well, we help people to measure, compare, and report the nutritional quality of their food. Measurement frameworks, comparison frameworks, and reporting frameworks. Um, we help solve this and make this an easier to navigate system with a various uh, suite of tools both wet chemistry and a technology called spectroscopy or photospectroscopy, where we use lights and lasers to drive down the cost of testing. Um, and we use lab partners where we produce this data. That data comes through our system, gets organized. And I'm going to show you all the cool tools that we've built that will allow people to uh, organize, share, and communicate the nutritional quality of their products. Um, okay. Um, a few high level comments on. What are we measuring? What are nutrients? Um, what you see on the column on the left is what we look at uh, today as a food system, right? It's primarily the information that you find on a nutritional facts panel. Um, because many people use databases, it all ends up looking the same, but there's very little expressed variation, uh, plus or minus 20% observed in nutritional facts panel when you're talking about core uh, staples, right? Um, and the problem is 
that the depth of that nutritional panel does not allow you to actually look at the variability of that nutrition experienced in that food product. So what Audacious does is we go one step deeper. Uh, Audacious looks at um, fat, fat profiles. So the saturation, the relationship between um, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, saturated fats. And we understand those relationships, including 639, 63 ratios, omega balances. We look at carbohydrate profiles, and this is mostly built around sugar and starch and fiber. Uh, the relationship between soluble and insoluble fiber is really important and conveys a lot about the management system and the genetics. Um, protein, amino acids. Um, we This is interesting. I would say we are seeing less expressed variability in protein profiles. Muscle, it's a cut. All of our muscles work the same way. Animals' muscles work the same way. It's not, um, we are seeing good evidence that feeding systems in confined animals can change some of the amino acid levels. Wild versus raw, um, wild versus confined does look different. But if you really want to get into the expression of how that muscle from a protein basis is expressing, proteomics is kind of next level of where things are heading there. Um, Vitamins, right? So vitamins and minerals, um, the foundational micronutrients to health uh, within this list there are both essential and non-essential nutrients within our bodies. Um, but there are two classes that we look at, fat-soluble and um, uh, water-soluble vitamins. So fat-soluble being A, D, E, K, uh, and then the B vitamins uh, and kind of looking at the continuum of expression of those vitamins. Uh, and then we look at um, elemental analysis. And uh, we, again, look at that on a deeper level than the nutritional facts panel. Um, we, uh, as a company, decided very intentionally not to be an expert in the bioactive space. Bioactives are phytochemicals. Phytochemicals are bioactives. Um, there are bioactives that are not phytochemicals, just to be clear. Um, but we, uh, we'll talk about what we're going to be reporting out and some of these tools. Um, and we've done some, we measured kind of terpenes and some other kind of, uh, classes of phytochemicals, but, um, these are the relationship between human health and phytochemicals. We are at the starting line. And this is so important in terms of where we're going to be going in terms of the relationships between antioxidants and phytochemicals and like what these things do in the human body. Um, but it's just to convey that it's very early days uh, and where we're heading. So anyways, this is kind of gives you a profile of where uh, things are at. So just to put something for those of you who are working in this system, um, you know, traditional labs will do this for about a thousand bucks a pop, the nutritional facts panel. Um, we do, uh, we have, cheaper pricing because we run in batches at our lab. And this is kind of the panel that we provide. Um, academics are really the groups that are focused on what I'd call deeper metab metabolomic type analyses. Um, and there's a group called the Periodic Table of Food Initiative that is trying to standardize metabolomics across university partners so that they have comparable and accurate frameworks by which to say, the data that I ran at my lab is the same as the data ran at your lab. Uh, we can trust and make those comparisons. That is a, another huge problem that we won't even begin to unpack here. Um, so we generate lots of data at our lab that kind of understands the relationships between um, all of these nutrients that we're understanding. We organize them, we present them out, we give people tools to then accurately quantify the nutritional impacts we look across management systems. Uh, we're basically building a management, um, an operating system for connecting the dots between agriculture and human health. Um, I'm gonna show uh, a bunch of the tools and we're gonna show some of the visualizations from the Beef Project uh, so that if there's anyone from the Beef Project on here that uh, wants to know what's coming their way in the next six to eight weeks, um, they will get that um, presented. And so that's the context for the second half of this presentation, which I'll do in the about the next 10 minutes or so, which is um, we are serving as BFAs uh, and the BI's technology partner to present out the results of research studies that uh, connect the dots between agriculture and human health through the nutritional quality of food. Um, and so we're strategic partners on mission in that research and bringing that beef study to market 
um, and always happy to collaborate on more opportunities. Um, oh, I am in the wrong presentation. That makes sense. Give me one second. <clears throat> It's not the right one either. Cool. Yeah. One more second. Also have to do here. Okay, um, so uh, I'll put this in the context of our partnership with the BFA and how we work. So um, we collect data from the field or farm practices or other conditions. Um, we also do this for processing, right? So um, the starting point and the ending point of nutrition, uh, we don't really understand well. Um, and it really depends on the food type. But imagine you're starting at 100 at the farm, whether or not you end up at a nutritional quality of 80 or 70 is largely going to determine, be determined by the supply chain and how that food is being processed. And what I think is happening is a lot of foods might even be starting high, but they're just getting destroyed uh, via shipping, storing, handling, processing, time. Um, and we're ending up with much lower quality nutrition. So the processing question is actually really interesting to me. Um, but uh, given we only have five minutes left, I will kind of show some of the tools that we've developed uh, for the purposes of the BFA. So- um, you, you, have, you have 20 minutes, Eric. It's, it's 1.40. So you have oh, okay. to two o'clock. No rush. This great. Is great. Keep, take your time. It's great stuff. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, so, um, right. So if we want to understand the relationship between, um, agriculture and human health, we have to break down that agriculture problem. So this data collection issue is actually way more complex than we think. Uh, internally, we use a framework called GEMIN, uh, G E M Y N, and it stands for genetics, environmental conditions, management practices, equals yield by nutrition, right? So the whole way the food system works today is GEMI. You put genetic, uh, you put a varietal in a soil, and then you apply some management framework to that soil and you get an outcome. And the only outcome we've been able to measure as a society to this day has been yield, right? So our whole system is just based on volume. Nobody's fault. We haven't built the tools. We're going to solve that. Now, what happens if we introduce nutrition as a data layer? How does that influence in our understanding of the relationship between G, breed, varietal, genetics, environmental conditions, soil health, weather, climate, um, microbial biodiversity, fungal, bacterial ratios, you name it. Uh, and then the management practices, all the inputs, regenerative practices, tillage, what types of fertilizers we're using, uh, you name it, right? And then processing is a part of that management practice as well, right? And so outcomes and outcome, nutrition, and nutrition gets managed, measured in a lab. Uh, and so you generate that data set. Uh, and then we combine and, and make tools to visualize those data sets so that people can experience and live them and make better decisions. And that's the basis of what we're all trying to do is have better decision-making frameworks. But if we don't have the data and the data is not accessible, nobody's going to make better decisions because there's nothing to do. Um, and what we really want to do is make tools for publishing and sharing this information so that we can create value um, throughout the food system. Um, okay, so when you send a food sample off to the lab, everybody's used to kind of getting these boring chemical reports. We've kind of built a new beautiful system for looking at that data, comparing that data, uh, analyzing it, storing it, uh, and having a kind of better information for tracking all of those samples. We then built a management collection framework that allows you to kind of like say, where did that food come from? Track the management, the GEMI uh, conditions of that nutrition so that you can start to store and learn, hey, which breed did I use? Which which pastures did this come from? 
uh, what was the diversity of those pastures, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all of the samples get kind of organized in the database. Um, and then what we get to do, and this is kind of a, a live view of what will be coming out as part of the, the, the beef study, will be a nutrient distribution and uh, an understanding of that distribution that is expressed within that food type. Um, and I'll, I'll show you what the workbook looks like in a second, but um, this is... This is it. This uh, the understanding to be able to visualize what Dan has been communicating to us for the past ten years is that there is extreme variability in the nutritional quality of these products. Um, the observed nutrition that we are visualizing is significant. Um, these are um, I don't know if this is real data, um, but this is what we're experiencing as a result of now having the tools is that we can visualize that distribution. Um, time series. So this is really important because, and, and I, I guess this is like one of those things that's like nobody's problem and everybody's problem. Depending on when you harvest that food, you are getting a different product every time. The seasonality of animal products is real. The seasonality of vegetables and fruits is real. The time to get that fruit and vegetable to your mouth objectively matters more than the season in which it's harvest or the time of harvest. But when it comes to animal products, seasonality really affects uh, vitamin profiles, mineral profiles, fat profiles, uh, phytochemical profiles. Um, okay. And so... Um, I don't have the final numbers. I think it's going to be about 180 different farms will be getting their results from uh, BFA and Audacious via this platform. So each producer will be invited to log in, see the results that they obtained, and then begin to explore uh, the distribution, the time series, and the connections between these relationships. And this is... Um, Dan has showed some of these graphs before. Stefan has showed some of these graphs before. This is like, this is not real data. Please do not copy uh, and paste and send this to anyone. This is just uh, screenshot visualizations. We're pumping all the data in right now. Um, but it's important nonetheless to say, what is the relationship between um, you know omega groups, omega-3 and pasture species? What is the relationship between selenium and um, you know, uh, the soil carbon. Um, there's lots of different relationships that we're going to be making available to explore as a result of these tools and technology. Um, and then what we're going to be able to do is allow people to create workbooks uh, of visualizations that they want to share. And then they'll be able to kind of share those visualizations with their partners, with their suppliers, with their ecosystem and say, hey, here's my nutrition. Here's the practice. Um, here's the outcome. Um, all that kind of good stuff. Um, so the BFA will get a, um, kind of behind the scenes look at the study and they'll be able to kind of see, um, and invite their partners to be able to see the data. So the study participants, so each ranch will be able to log in, kind of click on their results, see what nutrition that they're delivering. Um, and then, uh, BFA will publish that data set, uh, publicly and allow people to say, uh, you can see the distribution. But if you want to understand where that sample came from, the ranch partner has to actually opt in because it's their data and say, yes, I'm willing to share who's producing this level of nutrition. Um, this should blow your mind, right? All of a sudden, for the first time, producers are able to market and communicate off of objective data about the nutritional quality of their products. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and then so BFA will get this workbook and it'll be published online. Um, all of this will kind of be available in kind of six to eight weeks. We're pretty excited about it. Um, and um, and so if I backtrack for just a second here, oh, I don't know this stuff. I'll just show one more thing and then we'll, we'll call it there. Um, but so... Um, 
we uh, took on as a technology partner to host this data for BFA because we think there's another a market problem that should be solved in terms of helping people to communicate this story. And so the primary thing that we do as a for-profit company is then help you understand the marketing and claims tools that can be made off of your results, right? And so that's how we make money is we give you the tools to then say uh, and report out, hey, I'm doing a good job and uh, you can see all my results here uh, on this audacious page where they have verified our results as a trusted third party that generates uh, nutrition data. Um, and so, yeah, that, um, I might have trouble pulling that up. I'm gonna stop trying to do stuff on the fly. Why don't we stop there? That was a solid 50 minutes and uh, we'll jump over to uh, the questions and answers and all that good stuff, Dan. Brilliant. Well, that was great. Um. <laughs> and, and I should say, I am, uh, you know, we're, I am, I, I would love to like give you all a live tour of the lab. Dan uh, helped us open this lab. Um, and there's currently, we're expanding, we're knocking down walls and getting ready for four new instruments so that we can do this all for all kinds of crop types. And it's, uh, it's getting exciting. So, um, getting exciting. Go this journey. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> it's been very exciting for for a number of years, and I really appreciate your leadership in this space. Um, I think you sort of mentioned, you know, that you're a systems thinker, and that's how you identify. Um, I said a few times about yourself. It really is a a big complex problem, and you know, I've been talking about this stuff for a long time, but but having someone step in and really, you know, start to shoulder some of these big issues is it's it's real real work so kudos to you and and um yeah good good luck figuring it all out I'm glad glad to have somebody else completely I, my I always laugh Bye. like you were we're in conversations and I'll be there with my my team and just be like banging our heads up against the wall like trying to like organize like complex chemistry and trying to like figure out how to report and move things and and like trying to understand the regulatory environment and and I'm like if this if this wasn't a tough problem, someone else would have solved it. Like, is yeah. a reason we're all here together trying to solve this problem is because it is a very tough problem. Yeah, and you've got a, a wonderful team you've brought together. I've been able out to meet them and 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 yeah, really sense a lot of passion and intelligence and and creativity. And you know, it's not just having a, a big problem that you're working on, but the, the the ability to create a team and a business to 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 engage it is is no small feat. So I really a lot of respect for everything you're doing in that in that regard. I really um I, I don't I don't think I could. So I'm <laughs> takes a better man than myself. Yeah. <clears throat> um I mean at, at the end you were you were speaking a little bit about where Audacious is going and it is a company and you were focusing primarily on on you know what your relationship is to the BFA, but feel free to you know share with us perhaps more broadly or more, you know, like where do you see yourself in five years, 10 years? What's what what's the um What's the future that you're that you're seeing? Yeah, because you started off thinking it was a measurement problem, and now it's you've you really have iterated as you've understood in in what you're what you're aiming to do. Yeah, that's a um, good question. So the part of the problem, and I tried to elucidate this a little bit, is like we rarely measure things coming out of the field. Like we have massive, massive whole food and ingredient supply chains but we never touch that food and, and we're never able to measure it. And this is why Dan and, and the meter and, and photo spectroscopy of being able to like assess in real time in the supply chain is really important. Um, and when you look at everyone that's making decisions in the food system, they're relying off generic data sets to then tell a story and are unable to make better decisions as a result. So we, thought long and hard about like where to start and what's the right problem to attack. And I'm not going to lie, we've already pivoted a few times to try and address like the right entry points and wedges into this market. But um, we still think that ingredients and whole foods are the right place because that's the foundation of our food system. And there's going to be this massive trend back to whole foods. And there's this massive opportunity with the health and wellness space to be able to market and differentiate higher quality 
whole foods and ingredients because that's the basis of our diet and the basis of ingredients that get processed into other foods. So we're trying to build um, the, the, the foundation by which we have a deeper understanding of the nutritional quality of whole foods and ingredients. And so that's phase like phase one is to like do that for all kinds of crop types. And we've mostly done that for animal products. We're doing that for grains now, and we're gonna then do that for fruit and veg. Uh, maybe down the road, we start working on processed foods, but I, I don't really see that as our core expertise. It's more helping people tell a better story about the nutritional quality of whole foods. Um, the photo spectroscopy, so spectrometers, I think this is good. You know, everyone's been here in Dan for a long time about what, uh, you know, what would it take to be able to shine a, a light onto a piece of food and then be able to report out the nutritional quality of that product? Um, the the core challenge here is just like what you'd call um, the level of depth that the market is currently asking for as per regulatory information, uh, which is guided by reporting nutrients uh, and being able to measure nutrients with those devices. And then can you create profiles or like quick reporting tools to help people quickly and easily differentiate uh, irrespective of a nutrient? So I would say getting from individual nutrients to a nutritional profiling system is how spectroscopy can really be unlocked. And this is, you've been saying this for a long time, Dan, is just like, we figure out what the biomarkers are. We communicate those biomarkers and the relationships. If we can read with a photospectrometer those certain biomarkers, we can correlate that back to a, a better profile within the food. Turns out there's a lot of science that goes into that, figuring out that equation. And so yep. what we do in our lab is food samples come in, uh, we run them through the analytical chemistry, but then we also run them through very expensive benchtop spectrometers uh, that are hundreds of thousands of dollars to capture as much information as possible so that we can then introduce lower cost equipment to build off those models. Uh, and this is where new tools and neural networks and machine learning come into play because we're looking at, and machine learning is perfect for this because if you think about what a chemometric or a spectral profile is, it's thousands of data points of like, and it's, it's vibrational spectroscopy, you're vibrating molecules, and then you're capturing a signal. And humans, we objectively look for shapes and patterns that we can understand and grok with our eyes. And we're like, okay, there's that protein profile. It's a little higher, like maybe this fat profile. But when you feed that into a machine and you say, I want you to correlate this information, this information, and learn what these signals are, the world like totally becomes an, like, so unlocking Dan's vision <laughs> has required a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of dollars. <laughs> it's like, we're going to get there. And I, and I think it's only possible now because of the advances in computer science of being able to read those spectral profiles. But um, the vision is how do we get this information into the supply chain for better decision-making? That was a long answer to a very simple question. Which I don't think you actually answered, um, <laughs> which was, what is what is the where do you see audacious in five years? I mean, you said we're going to be tracking out. I mean, maybe it was it was you implied these things, but you didn't give a specific statement. Yeah. You're going to be tracking out. You know, you've done done animal products. You're working on grains. You're going to be doing fruits and vegetables. And then what? And <clears throat> and the the vision of a meter or meters. So you're, I mean, do you want to just elaborate with more specifics about what you're yeah, yeah, yeah. tending to do so, or just leave it, leave it, leave us hanging like that? No, no, no. That was, that yeah. was, I think you summarized it well, which is like, we characterize and understand the nutritional variability of whole foods and ingredients well, and that information is accessible to the market yeah. to be able to make better decisions. Yep. Uh, level two is we've developed low cost measurement technologies to have quicker and better profiles to lower the cost of measuring that nutrition to begin with. And then level three is we've developed a suite of communication and marketing tools that allows producers and consumers to connect to better understand the quality that is being offered in the market. And what that'll look like in three years or five years on any of these fronts and who would be engaging it and instruments that would be able to be used and do you want to speak to any of that right now? Or I, I, don't, I don't want to pressure you if you don't want to, because I know it's always. No, I, the, I don't know that I have good answers. I have, yeah. you know, visions. Um, but 
we're we're hopefully like again to like how I started this conversation of like who pays, right? So we're a for-profit business. We have to make money. The people who are we are finding right now as our best customer base is brands uh, and consumer package good companies who are some type of vertical integration yep. or and, or producers that go direct to consumer or go into a supply chain. They're the ones who are like, hey, I'm doing a good job. I need help finding the data to tell a better story. So that's like where we are today is like trying to get product market fit to like communicate that, help people and tell that story. That I think we're going to be doing that for the next few years to really try and nail that well. Um, the spectroscopy question um, is is really up for debate. So we could sell uh, or make available spectral data sets that people can plug in on and build off of, right? Uh, and that like, if we understand, uh, if we've run a thousand samples of wheat and we understand the spectral profile of wheat better than anyone, someone can then tap into that database, run those samples and have a lower cost instrument and device to be able to do that in the supply chain. Um, to be fair, that exists today, but you can only really differentiate total fat, total protein, moisture. There's no granularity to the data. Um, yeah. And then partnerships is, yeah, a long, there's lots of opportunities there. Well, maybe we'll, we'll circle around this conversation a few times in the next hour during our Q and a process. I think I've got a few more points I want to drill in, but I see both Erwin and, and Shauna have oh, turned their cameras, which I think means they want to, want to engage. So who wants to go first? Erwin's, Erwin's muted. It looks like. You go, Shauna. Make that kids in the background too. Shauna. There at um, it's a little bit distracting seeing the kids in the background, or what I have to say. So, uh, <laughs> it's very, it's Sorry, very, Dan. very sweet, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just trying, Eric. Uh, good to see you. Jongens, zeg eens gefeliciteerd met je verjaardag. There's the whole family right there. Beautiful. Happy birthday. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very oh. much. Okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so I, I was trying to jump in through the Q&A and notice I don't have access to that, but um, I deal with a lot of the onboarding with uh, questions for people who are either participating in our studies or you know looking to participate. So I thought I'd throw a couple of questions at you here. So straight from the horse's mouth, you know, so I, <laughs> I relay this to people. Um, but one of the things I was curious about when you were presenting is your database. Is there an opportunity for people to send in results that maybe they have got from a previous lab and access the database, put their results in that, or will will they need to go through your lab in order to be included in that? Question one. Question one. Um, so first off, I want to give a huge shout out to Shauna. She's the you know, yes. driving force <laughs> behind so much of how this all has become a reality today. Uh, <laughs> you know, weekly and bi-monthly calls for at least the past year. So thank you, Shauna, for being such a tireless uh, champion of, of these efforts. Um, so to answer that question, you cut right to the core of like, what is one of the, another huge problem in the space, which is what we call inter-lab comparability. And um, yeah. this is problematic and why the USDA database they only report stuff from their lab in Maryland where they run on their own instruments and their own machines because you cannot really make good apples to apples comparisons on with two different labs with two different results. And the reason for that is, and we do a lot of this, we call it proficiency testing, where we have lab partners, we send samples, either certified reference, certified reference material or other samples to a lab partner and say, hey, can you run this? We run it ourselves and then we check and industry acceptance is kind of like 20 to 30%, which is crazy. So that's saying that like I could report, you know, I have one milligram of omega-3, you have 1.3 milligrams of omega-3. We don't know who's got a good answer there. The only thing that we can do uh, is have consistent methodologies and consistent frameworks for measuring that within a lab system to make sure that it's all comparable and accurate over time. And this has been a problem, uh, you know, the, the beef study, part of why it's taken so long for everyone is there's been so much evolution in the methodologies to produce that data. 
Um, and now we uh, have our own methodologies where we make sure that it's consistent, repeatable, accurate, and precise. And we actually have um, ISO 17025 accreditation, which says we're following best quality management standards and systems for producing consistent, repeatable results. To answer your question, no, we can't just take a sample from another lab at another point in time and then throw that into a very structured database because we don't know um, how that data was produced, under what methods, what instruments, and what time frame, how that sample was sampled. So we have a very uh, robust structure for how data can be compared and analyzed because we need to maintain transparency and trust in, in the, the, the source of that data. Uh, and so that's why in our platform, we tell you what instruments, we tell you what methodologies, and so that you can have and track those comparisons over time. It's not that you can't bring it into the system. It's just that you can't throw it up against a database that was all produced consistently. And I and I agree with that. I've just had several people be like, well, I've had this testing over here. My zinc level was this. And I'm like, yeah, so so I agree. You can't necessarily compare apples to apples, just, even if they are, uh, are around the <laughs> from different It's a really important point for, I think, to, to sort of emphasize for people who are out there maybe with some fanciful, you know, <laughs> trust that science can give us answers and numbers are real and all that. I mean, one of the biggest awarenesses, you know, for, in going through this process for so long is just the way you test is such a big deal. It really like, like you said it, Eric, but just to say it like a couple different ways, <clears throat> you take the same sample and you run it through three different labs that all seem legitimate and appropriate and and formal and proper and they get dramatically different numbers and and i mean what are numbers in the begin with <laughs> and, and is it really does nutrients do they really matter and like they, all of a sudden you can begin to go to these sort of deeper like metaphysical sort of questions about what are we actually trying to do here in the first place but you know i well, think the concept of science as a framework for discerning into having a, a baseline as a common lingua franca is, is i think i still support it entirely but but being honest about how capable the instrumentation is and what we actually know and don't know. Um, yeah, just to emphasize yeah, that. It's service to have a baseline, like you said, Dan, and then for producers to be able to compare, at least as they're making management practices, to see which direction they're going in terms of nutrient content just within their samples. So I won't, I won't keep going that way, but then I had just one more question, which is, what are you currently open to? Is that individual testing or is it more of a research project where you prefer group comes to you um, that way? Or is it people can send in one ribeye sample and expect to start getting results? And I think yeah. with that, I'll say thank you very much and then go back to being in uh, the <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, we're, we're ready to, you, we, have, we have a full system. If you want to send a sample, one, three, six, we're ready to report out for all our software tools. We'll help you make claims. We'll help you share with those results. Um, and yeah, that's uh, we're, we're a, a for-profit company that's up and running, ready to serve that. And it's our, we keep our costs low today um, to be able to um, um rather than the, the the lab pricing that I mentioned, the traditional lab pricing of thousands of dollars is because we run our samples in a panel and we run it in a batch. So we have a very structured panel that we analyze and we do that in batches. So if you send it off to a service lab, they promise you like a three to five day turnaround time. They run you through their system. They have to keep lots of people and lots of instruments all going all at the same time. That's not what we do. We say our batch run is starting this day. Uh, you'll get your results in three weeks. Uh, and that way it just allows us to keep pricing down uh, on the wet chemistry. Um, and then we hopefully, um, and this is what we're working on, we will be able to predict the omega balance of animal products using the photospectrometers uh, next year, which is exciting for us to be able to offer a low quality, a low cost test to do this. And so instead of hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, we can do it for tens of dollars. 
So just to be clear, that's all animal products and all grains right now, or any crop at all. You can people will can send in. Samples. Just right now for us, it's just animal products. Just animal products, okay. Yeah. Right now, it's going to be improving. And then grains soon. will be starting next year. Perfect. And that omega balance number, I mean, is a sample. So people now, people who've been part of the beef project and say basically, we want to, you know. <clears throat> Or let's say we had somebody yesterday send send in a sample a, a check and say hey we want to be part of the beef project we're like no we're done we, we've 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 collected all the samples we're going to you know the whole reason we did this complex thing was to see if we could find patterns that correlated and create a simple assessment and it sure looks like I mean, we haven't published everything yet but it sure looks like that omega three omega six dynamic is um, is a central one and so what you will be providing people is the ability to for a few tens of dollars send in a sample of any of their animal products and they will know you know where that sits so as far as a rough baseline of nutrient density if we want to call it that you, anybody can send in a an animal product and get that reading from you that's will be available next year you're telling us but it's not yet available yeah yeah so okay. brilliant yeah. <laughs> right i mean this is the, the these are like from a practical standpoint people are like i want to know what my, how my stuff is like you don't have to pay twenty five hundred dollars anymore. <laughs> it yeah. could be fifty dollars or thirty dollars. <laughs> and this is part of the issue is we look at supply chains, and if you're an aggregator or a processor, you're taking from dozens, if not hundreds, of farms and trying to figure out what, how do you market that end product? And you can't uh, tell a unifying story because it's just the, the meat supply chain is just so complex. And yeah. the explosion in direct to consumer and grass fed and all of these stewards of the land that are doing a really good job. They finally have a toolkit to say, uh, hey, uh, my 6-3 ratio is is uh, 0.8 to 1, which is like for yeah. beef is incredible. And like you're starting to see really, really cool things happening. Yeah. And but you envision that as a process where people will have to send in a sample to your lab, not that one will you be able to provide instrumentation that people could use themselves. Eventually, or right? So again, we're talking like five to 10 years out, um, but- I, my Not biggest sure. learning with this whole thing, Dan, is technology and science take way longer than you think it does. <laughs> it's like... And perhaps cost a lot more money too. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, we, we were just talking a little bit about, I think, PTFI or the implications of it. And it's intention with Shauna's question. I think it's worth mentioning for those who, who are not aware, I did try to get, um, Oh, what's her name? Um, Selena. Selena Ahmed on, on, but couldn't, couldn't get her scheduled for this conference. But yeah, I mean, you're versed in what they're doing and it's a, it is a very large global endeavor. And as far as the state of the Trinity is concerned, it's something that's a piece of what's happening out there. Do you want to just give us a few minutes on that or as long as you. Yeah. Um, so I should say is as far as I understand, like I have had yeah. little, very little interaction engagement with yeah. them. Um, yeah. So it's a it's a major initiative funded by the Rockefeller uh, Foundation, and it is consuming major major dollars, and I think quite rapidly. Um, but they're kind of trying to do two goals. One is to um, create a database of, of publicly available information that uh, illuminates the dark matter of food. So many of the compounds we talked about today, but many of the deeper compounds uh, and metabolites that aren't currently understood or reported or measured. Um, I think they've realized it's a very expensive effort. And so they're scaling more back towards our direction in terms of like getting, uh, you know, the, the fatty acids, the proteins, the vitamins, the minerals, and, and getting that type of information. They do look at some deeper information they have to generate it all through academic lab partners. And so they have to pay all of those academic lab partners. It's a very slow process. It's time consuming. Um, but all of that information is going into their database. That database is live and publicly accessible. Um, however, you'll see there's not a lot of samples and not a lot of information in it. And so um, I think it's a very important effort. And I think they're trying to step on the toes of the US government and saying, you need to be doing more in this space. Yeah. Um, I know they're in conversations with USDA to try and get them to use their frameworks to standardize and report out this stuff. The biggest problem is trying to get academic labs to have consistent methodologies between them. <laughs> and Who knew? Here, 
coordinating among and and they're trying to do this on a global basis too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I give them kudos for what they're trying to do and unlock. Um, I'm I'm assuming the purse strings are getting a little thin, and so they're trying to figure out what other partners can come in and how do they expand. But um, yeah. uh, it's an important effort nonetheless. But our how we differentiate ourselves is we're looking at a very clear set of nutrients upon which there is a very clear relationship to human health outcomes. They're trying to do much more. And this goes into this bioactive space and a lot of other things where the evidence base for that um, human health impact is scant. And yeah. that's not to say that the evident, the absence of evidence is the, um, uh, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah. uh, it, it'll be important for us to build that evidence base so that research can start to understand what's the relationship between bioactives and food and human health. Yeah, I, I remember when I first started talking to them about that a couple of years ago when it was still, I think, not formally launched. You know, they were envisioning many hundreds of nutrients, if not thousands per crop is what they were planning on assessing. And they were only envisioning doing one sample per crop and then thinking that that would somehow, or some few, and that that would be giving them the answers they were looking at. And they've, it seems like pivoted, you know, in the way that you have as well towards, okay, what do we, what can we do? What's realistic? Maybe a thousand or 10,000, you know, nutrients per crop is unreasonable. We actually don't even have the protocols for assessing them, who actually cares. And they're starting to look, I think, much more at the, you know, getting samples from different environmental conditions, different genetics, different management practices to characterize that variation. So it's possible, you know, three years down the pike, a lot of these groups that have all been sort of coming at it from their own directions are settling around a, a, like a, a high ground of like, this seems to be the best way that we can get this thing done. And this, and so, I mean, I guess <clears throat> maybe that's part of what I'm sensing in this conversation is that there is that, that general consensus, you know, being arrived at, we're not there yet, but maybe it's a, a, only two or three years out, but um should there be multiple groups globally all struggling with this, all coming to reasonably similar conclusions, perhaps then we could be at a point where we could begin to have this conversation about what nutrient density is. And I, I think I really appreciated how you had initially commented on that in the first couple of slides. I think you said, you know, you know, some do it ver versus via calories, some do it via weight, some do it via serving size, um, you know, I know you've got a lot of thoughts about this yeah, and, and yeah. you've shared them with me privately. I don't know how much you want to say. I, I really appreciate your thought because you are thinking deeply about this and you do have strong considered suggestions about, about how we should go through the, about this process. I, I know you, you said some of that previously, but, but feel free yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. So um, pulling some threads there, you know, so what what is the relationship between um soil health and nutritional outcomes and and human health and trying to draw lines between these points is very complex we're, we're dealing in very complex systems yeah very complex ecology systems very complex food food is biochemistry is a very complex a, a piece of food is a very complex matrix of biochemistry and then what happens in our bodies, also a very complex system. So as humans in our communication, we love to like simplify this framework of like healthy soil, healthy people, healthy animals, healthy food, you know, and it's, it's not that simple. It's just, it's not going to be that straightforward. And, and you're starting to see little evidence start to trickle out on the variability between uh, conventional, traditional agronomic practices, or I shouldn't say traditional, I should say modern, uh, synthetic agricultural practices, um, or true organic practices. And I, I don't, I like, it even pains me to, to differentiate regenerative as somehow different than organic. Um, yeah. but like there are so many different factors and uh, variables that contribute to an outcome and the outcome that we're seeing expressed within the food today um, there's a lot of variability. Um, and, but when you get into the variability and you start to pull back the layers of like the variability in the minerals and the vitamins and phytochemicals and all of these compounds that are poorly understood, we just don't understand what they do for human health. And so we like hit a wall because 
you're then trying to make the leap to human health. And it's like, well, does this matter? Does this matter if the human's eating a bunch of junk food? Does it matter if the gut's all effed up? Does it matter if um, like this person is of Indian descent versus American descent? Um, and, and we like, that's where these two groups don't like really connect with each other. And I think that's really hard. And so to get into like definitions and frameworks. The groups don't currently or the groups can't? I think the groups haven't yet. Don't or, currently. Or, um, right. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You know, agriculture and human health and nutrition are seen as like a wall. And yeah. there's giant food companies and CPGs that have like unbelievable human health departments and nutritionists and all these people doing research and they just sell a bunch of processed and 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 crappy food. And so it's like, what, what, like why aren't these groups talking to each other? <laughs> and it's crazy because while I'll go into these biz, big businesses and try and like partner and sell and like learn and. The thing that I'm really excited about is all of a sudden we can tell them that that all these groups should be looking at the same data sets together because it's the food. It's the food dummy. It's it's the the story of how these things connect. Sorry, I'm getting off track. So no, it's great. I love the passion. I love it. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> what the relationship is. So if you use that food and you try and connect that to human health, we like have a, a decent understanding of that. If you try and take the food and connect it back to land, the, the practice that produced that food, I objectively, I think we have a good understanding of it uh, in animal products and a poor understanding of it in everything else. Um, and I think that's what's going to evolve. But then how you connect these two, the human health to the agriculture story, is going to take a long time for it to generate the data and the evidence base upon which to uh, extrapolate these relationships. Now, in terms of getting to a definition of nutrient density, this is like the core problem is, are you building a health centric framework? Are you building an ecology centric framework? Or are you building a universal framework? And Dan's been very adamant that we need to build a universal framework that takes into the ecological outcomes as much as the human health outcomes. The, the challenge with that is, uh, Getting the ecological data attached to a food sample is really hard. So we can build prediction mechanisms when we look at the nutrient composition of food and say, using machine learning, I think this correlates is predict this nutrient composition is predictive of soils from this place with these characteristics. Um, and so it's kind of like if you think about isotopic tr tracing of like, okay, I can see a nutritional signature within the food that relates back to a land management practice. And what we just talked about, the omega-6-3 ratio is 100% that. It's a biomarker that tells us the quality of the land in which that system was produced. So I think the first time we're like, oh, duh, we already knew this. Like we actually have yeah. a very clear biomarker evidence. And then when you get into the human health side, and this is like what's becoming quickly very controversial is you know, seed oils and omega balances and like the evidence base of like whether or not inflammation in the body is contributed by these things. And so there's less agreement in the human health side now that I'm seeing. I, I thought it was the reverse. I thought there was more agreement on the human health side dynamics and that like it was going to take a lot to pull out these relationships in the agronomy to the food. And what I'm realizing is the nutrition is actually because they do studies epidemiologically that cause their own problems in the evidence base of how they extrapolate these relationships. And so I'm realizing like, it's going to take more work here to, to like show, okay, yeah. grass. And it was so fun, like anecdotal story. Like I'm from New Jersey, like my family's pretty center, right? Center, just like kind of all over the place, this whole environmental grass fed stuff. They don't like listen to me. My uncle like recently had a pretty bad heart scare. And the first thing he did was he's like, I'm only eating grass fed beef now. And I was like, I was like, oh, Uncle Joe, like, what, what, what? where, where did you get that from? He's like, well, you know, I've heard that the omega balance is a lot better for, for, for inflammation. I was like, oh my God, this is like, it's penetrating. Like people are starting to hear this. <laughs> it's like, if my like New Jersey Italian family is starting to hear that stuff, I'm like, something's yeah. happening. <laughs> That's very exciting. And, and, and. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, so much to talk about there with with the nutrition side, and that's who we're going to have, you know, speaking next week to conclude the conference as a as a doctor who's been looking, you know, she's credentialed in many different fields. She'll go into all them all, all, but really that sort of complex holistic perspective 
from the human health side is one, you know, at the BFA, we've obviously been not, that's not been our focus, but, but integrating, integrating that aspect into this conversation um, has to be part of it. Otherwise, you know, all of the, all of the, the foundational theses can't be, can't be verified. I, I'm curious to hear you say that, that you, that what you're hearing is that the um, high levels of sixes and connection to inflammation and chronic disease is suspect. I thought that was, I did, I also thought that was fairly, fairly, uh, you know, established literature. Is that, is that not what you're? We, we have a, I have a team of pretty, what you'd call conservative, um, from a safe standpoint, right? From a, yeah. where there has to be the evidence base in the science to show that these relationships are demonstrated before we go out as a company to like claim them or say them. And yeah. um, so we were a little like, because Audacious needs to be a little less controversial in the food system, we have to be careful of like, okay, we can have papers that we can cite on these things. And so I asked them, I was like, hey, can you go out and like pull together the literature for me on this and like understand what's the relationship between omega balance or seed oils and like, and and human health impacts. And there's there's not as much evidence as we we think. And like some of the papers are a bit stretchy. And so it's like, we're really getting to see and understand these things. But again, like, what is the saying? The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, right? Um, and we're in this space right now where I think the human health research is so lacking because of the fact that nutrition research is funded by industry. It yeah. means we're we're stuck in this rock of this hard place of us saying beef is beef is beef, beef is good. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, milk is milk is milk and milk is good. And it's like, oh, all right, well, I mean, and then again, it depends on the framework of like where it sits. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, very interesting. And as you said earlier, the more we, you know, delve into this thing, the more complex um, it actually is, <laughs> the more ambitious of an endeavor it, it seems to be. Um, yeah, um, I'm just noticing we only have three questions in the Q&A. So people who are wanting to engage, feel free to uh, post something in the Q&A. We'll likely get to it. Erwin, did you have something you wanted to share? Now that uh, yeah, there. yes, certainly. Uh, it's so quiet now here. So, <laughs> so uh, Eric, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, and um, I uh, really hope we can uh, work with you um, because uh, we are trying as a group of farmers here in Europe to uh, grow nutrient dense food in a regenerative growing method, and we are looking for what management practices uh, contribute to that. Um, did I understand correctly that you don't have that much experience on vegetables yet? That's right. Um, and Erwin, I uh, loved your podcast on investing in region ag. It was, it was, it was really, really good. And uh, I mean, you know, breed, breeding and genetics, obviously it's the, the, the start of the process, but the home in which you place those genetics is going to determine the outcomes. I think epigenetics importance are coming, but yes, we, sorry, just sharing things I'm excited about. Uh, we do not, uh, we're not deep experts on vegetables yet, but if you have, um, we have ways of working with partner labs to help you get the data, organize the data, communicate the data. Um, we just have to be thoughtful about doing that in a cost-effective way because it is cost prohibitive right now to like do studies to, to move beyond an N of one sample to an N of, you know, 30 and N of 60 so that you can like throw that information out to the market without any risk. And that's, that's really the problem is like, okay, if it's, and the way that the way that the FDA and the USDA deal with this today is they tell you to composite samples. So, um, God, what was, what's one of your primary it's tomatoes? Um, no, it's in, but potatoes. Here. Same family, but right. <laughs> in the ground. So if you took, like the way the USDA or the, the FDA advises is you would take 12 potatoes, you would homogenize that into one potato, you'd send that uh, in, into one, one sample, and then you would send that one sample off for analysis. And if you wanted to look beyond a nutritional facts panel, again, that's going to cost you two to $3,000 per sample. Like that N of one, you can then go market off of that N of one sample and say, and say, Here's my certificate of analysis. Here's my potato. Here's the European average potato. And this is how good my stuff is. We can help you do that for 
probably a couple thousand bucks and you can make a, mar a nice marketing story out of it and like really be able to tell that. Um, but anyone, and I think you could catch buzz and like your, 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 your retail buyers would, would be interested in looking at that. But what makes it more compelling is when I have your N of one or your N of six or 12 against an N of 300. And then you know where that, that sample sits within yeah. the continuum, right? Yeah. That, that was our original idea with the, uh to join the BFA in the data explorer. Like there are so many data uh, sets in there, like benchmarks also to join them. And then uh, last time we talked with Dan, he said, well, maybe we need to uh, talk with Edacious. So <laughs> we do about this. And uh, we are not not really uh, interested now in, in marketing, um, maybe how good we are, but we are still in uh, perf um, perfecting fine. agronomics, you know? So our statement is be good and tell it. And we don't think we're good yet. And we have to be really good before we want to tell it. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, so we, yeah, it's about agronomics, and and that's in, in vegetables. It's it's hard, right? You know, in, in I think in animal uh, nutrition and grazing, it's at least to me, it sounds really mm, kind of easy what you should do, do's and don'ts. And yeah. um, I don't know, in growing vegetables, um, <laughs> it's not only the do's and don'ts, but it's it's you know the weather, the climate, the varieties. It's it's everything. It's uh, yeah, it's tough. Um, it's tough. I would recommend you know um, Wagenhagen and 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 there's just good. Yeah, I know, um, but they, they're really they conservative. Have, they do have yeah. you know labs where they do help out. For, yeah. like in the U.S., there are a lot of like land grant universities that do have expertise in running this stuff. And so you can get cheap analysis or bulk pricing from university partners yeah. because it's all subsidized. Yeah. 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 We have that here context too. But then again, they say we can measure anything. Just tell, tell me what, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I just want to know, <laughs> is this cover crop better than the other in providing yeah. nutrient richer potatoes, uh, you know, yeah. stuff like that. And uh, so we need partners in that, who can tell them is, what to research, you know? This is this is part of the whole question is, you know, what are the things that you think are the important things to be measuring and how do we know what those important things are? And I think you were talking, Eric, about the knowledge is, is better in the agronomic side or you thought it was better in the nutrition side, but not, you know, back and forth. And I mean, the way we designed the beef study, I think at least on principle was, you know, to say we don't know and let's look at microbiome Yep. Overlaid against agronomic facts, overlaid against biochemistry, overlaid against, you know, human health responses. And if we ask the people in each one of those fields, at least right now, what they think is better and worse, and then we overlay them all on top of each other, we can begin to find patterns to what you were saying at the beginning of the presentation about it, about the, the you know, valuable role of, of um, AI or, or, you know, computer, you know, pattern forming. I, I, my, I, my, <laughs> my, I'm not sure if it's a faith or if it's a knowing or I guess it's probably a faith at this point. I, I, I truly believe that there, that there is, there are patterns in nature that, that are, are there. And if we're thoughtful enough and honest enough um, and, and systematic enough, we can, we can begin to find them. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. And it's just about knowing what data that we need to capture to then pull out yeah. those relationships. And this has been part of what's really been interesting for us because um, when you look at these vitamin levels or these mineral levels, um, it's not with, with respect to nutrient density, it's not like everything just goes up, right? It's like yeah. something goes up, something go down. And then like the relationships, the, the biochemical relationships of those minerals to each other, right? They're working off each other in different ways. And so we're talking about, uh, a profile and this is why profiles are really important because, um, just making more of everything more dense, that's not necessary. That's not the answer. The answer is understanding what's the right balance of these things within yeah. a food to deliver the most benefit to a human. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, it's, it's just, it's just tricky. And we like, and this has been really interesting too, is because like when it comes to confined animal feeding, the U S is very, 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 very good at feeding animals in confinement. They know how to optimize nutrition for those animals that don't move to get a consistent product out of that system. Um, and 
they spend a lot of time on formulation of those diets and getting the right mix and blend of things to get a certain outcome, which is generally weight gain and volume, right? So they're optimizing for the wrong thing. Well, they're optimizing for the thing that the market currently values, which is the most at the least possible price. Yeah. <clears throat> I, when you said it, in, in your presentation that you are not focusing on bioactives um, because we don't have sufficient data to, you know, confirm that these are, are you know, um, primary health giving nutrients and and foundationally they're harder to test and they're at lower concentrations and people don't really care right now the market's not focusing on them, you know, but, you know, I mean, I guess one of my thesis points has been that if, you know, the nutrient meter that we were evolved with was called our nose and our tongue, and the bioactives, the things we call flavor and aroma, are the things that correlate <laughs> with what we think we think is good. Then, you know, integrating that into the process, I guess that a thesis is that that those, the, you know, higher levels of those bioactives could be a biomarker. Um, we could find out what the patterns are, you know, with other nutrients and dynamics in them. Um, so... That's yeah. I mean, I guess this is all yet to be determined and and discerned, and it is a, a really big project. I you know, I we're talking about chemistry, biochemistry. We're talking about nutrients. We're talking about compounds, and you know, I would say from my time in Europe, you know, one of the things that I've experienced is that, um, you know, people who speak French have an entirely different historical perspective of the way things have been talked about for the past five hundred years or thousand years or whatever in their scientific, you know, framework, people that speak German actually have a different set of assumptions about what's important. And it seems like people who speak English, we think it's about the chemistry. Um, and, and when I go to, to, you know, mainland Europe, there seems to be a lot more attention and it, the Dutch speak, you know, to the vibration and coherence and, um, you know, what is that? And can we measure it? Yes, we certainly can measure it. Um, you know, it, it can be interpreted from the woo-woo side of things, um, which I'm not necessarily opposed to. But, um, you know, everything everything you're doing is in the chemistry mentality. Yeah. I, You know, early on, we've had conversations with people um, from MIT, et cetera, that were at least aware of that vibrational side. Do you have yeah. any comment about that or those other modes of analysis? <laughs> have you been looking into that at all? Because yes. we, it is a box. We're, we're, we're presuming the box is nutrients. And we're talking all about nutrients, but maybe some people would say there's a bigger, that's a box we're in. Totally. I, I totally agree with that framework, right? So um, with my like, again, like audacious, like resource constrained hat on, yes. right? I have to be yeah. selective yeah. because I can't measure everything under the sun. And this is yeah. like, I wish I could. I wish I was a billionaire with my own lab that I could just like yeah. run all these fun experiments, but I don't. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But the the again with the challenge with the bioactives it's like it's novel methods there's no consistency in those methods um so you can't trust any of the underlying data sets because you don't know who's producing them and where and if they're in academic papers you're like i learned that academic labs can have less quality control systems than a commercial lab so you you know <laughs> and let's not get into scientific papers but um there's like this challenge of measure consistent and stable measurement frameworks for actually being able to act upon that stuff and the extent to which it it appears at an abundance that is relative to our health and so I agree with your framing like yeah we are in the box of chemistry meets biochemistry biochemical nutrition um in today's modern context of science and and measurement uh for sure the future uh, of getting our our measurement tools and technology to mo look more like um, our tongues and our and our noses and and the the power of those tools, those are actually coming in different ways. There are um, volatile organic compound de measurement devices yep. that can then replicate a dog or a human nose. And you can hold that up to something and, and capture a VOC profile. And then what we could do is relate that VOC profile back to the underlying chemistry or the biochemical chemistry of that food. All of that's possible. What I would 
what I push back on and what I like to remind people of is what is the market asking for, right? It's like, we can take our own opinion and say, we think this matters and see who bites. But I would prefer to say, hey, market, what do you need and looking for and meet them halfway, right? And when it comes to this bioactive stuff, it's 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 important and it's growing, but it's niche and um, I want to be a part of it, but I'm not going to build a business off the back of it just yet. Which is something I think, you know, people who are, you know, more comfortable sitting back and taking pot shots and critiquing the way things are don't actually understand, which is if you're going to try to get into the middle of the river where the company and money and energy is flowing, you know, there are certain <laughs> dynamics there. And, you know, you can say, this is what I think should happen. But if you don't have the power to make it happen, you have to figure out who you can work with to facilitate that happening. Yeah. And if people aren't there, they aren't there. And so, you know, you can just, you can really only take the steps that are plausible. I think it's a really, it's a really, um, yeah, it's just, it's just a reality of, of how things are right now. And, 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 you know, how things should be, how things we'd like to be, you know, we can all, a lot of us are very educated about what we think problems are, but, but getting out there and actually doing something to, to move things, to actually move the bar is, is real work. So again, yeah. um, you know, I've been sitting back and taking pot shots or, you know, philosophizing and <laughs> grandstanding for a while, but you're really, you're really in the midst of it there. So yeah. Um, and, I'm going to read a couple of the questions. Oh, sorry. Did you want to respond? Yeah. I just it, like, I, I just get too excited about this stuff, but like, I, I do want to emphasize like the, the part of the struggle I have right now is in the context of our standard American diet and the way our guts look and the toxicity of our systems, I'm concerned that those phytonutrients aren't doing much for anyone. And that is like, again, like if we're going to like fix some of the health issues and health equity things, like we need to worry about like measurable micronutrient deficiencies in our system that are addressable because we can measure and report out on those things. Yeah. But the, the the concept of nutrient synergy is is like it's related to bioavailability, but it it, it refers to how nutrients, uh, enzymes, and like cofactors work together to create greater health effects. Right. So yeah. the way A, D, and K you know work together within your gut. But what someone said to me is like the antioxidants and a lot of the flavonoids and 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 some of the the colorful aspects of food that go into your gut and get digested and fermented are the cofactors that actually unlock a lot of the vitamins that help you maintain and be healthy and so when you have when you're devoid of these phytochemicals you're missing the helper compounds that are unlocking the the minerals and the vitamins within your system to make and confer greater health so i'm like it's it's like this weird chicken in the egg when it comes to this nutrient synergy question of like what are the the biological processes that unlock that nutrition for your body and you know we're just in such early days of these understandings well if that's an understanding that's i mean if that is a real understanding which there's data to suggest what you're telling me is it doesn't matter how many you know minerals are in the carrot if it doesn't have flavor those minerals will come in one end and go out the other is that what you, is that was that what you basically just said? I mean, I think that's what yeah, I just heard. That's you that's what we're beginning to see more is um, w this community uh, as we bridge the gap from agriculture and ecology and and production systems and starts talking about human health and uh, systems, just like we think about the microbiome of a root and the rhizosphere and what's happening there uh, and that the health of that system confers so that nutrition can transfer from that fungal ecosystem into that plant, uh, that same system is living in our guts and our, we need to understand that it's not just the nutrition in the food, it's the system in which we're placing that nutrition by which we are going to be able to actualize that nutrition within our bodies to coherently vibrate in today's modern world. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so basically... You've it's trained not... me well, Dan. You've trained me well. <laughs> as long as you're willing to say something <laughs> publicly, I'm, I'm still good with me. <laughs> um, if if 
you know, to repeat what you just said, from a farmer perspective, we understand that it's not the nitrogen, it's the where the nitrogen came from and how it got there. So what you're saying for the nutrition for the humans is it's not the zinc, it's how that zinc gets digested and made bioavailable. Which makes total sense, right? I mean, that's basically what you just said brilliantly. Yep, 100%. Well. Um, which then, if that <clears throat> correlates with the microbiome system function of the soil being critical for the plant to be healthy, if that corollary is the flavor of the food is the thing that's necessary for the microbiome of the our guts to function well, because it provides that flavor, those big, big compounds which get broken down in the gut into their component parts and get used in all kinds of different ways because they can cause nature's really good at this kind of stuff that <clears throat> that flavor is what unlocks the nutrients then that potentially is the answer to the to the sort of the the pushback you get from people talking about bioavailability and and how guts work and like we've done these trials and a lot of stuff is comes in one end and goes out the other and we're like well yeah because you're putting it in like chemical fertilizer it's not in a format that's bioavailable and so the way you know it's good is if it tastes good I mean, I think you just simplified things a lot. Totally. If I mean, what you're saying is true. Then that's really. <laughs> this is why you know the biggest scam in human history is the supplements industry. Right? <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm looking forward to once this conference is over, perhaps having a series of of um, uh, of uh, not panels, but like, you know, two people who have different perspectives on something and we can just sort of yeah. gently and, and politely, but really seriously go at it. Um, because yeah, I mean, I was always of that opinion, but I just met this guy in, in, uh, in the UK. He's done a lot of research for decades and nutrition and, and he was swearing for the value of, of supplements. And I was like, huh, I really am not intelligent enough to really argue with you, but I think, I think there's something wrong here. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, We've got 15 minutes left and we're starting to get some questions in. So let me just, let's see if we can start working through here. Uh, Noel, who is in Ireland, is a farmer, a wonderful farmer in Ireland, says, uh, will you be accepting animal product samples for omega-6-3 ratios from outside the U.S.? What's the logistics of international sampling? Um, yes, if you uh, dehydrate, um, I think we can. We have a so we have a USDA import permit, and so we can accept things uh, from individual farmers. Um, we just have to figure out the logistics of getting it from point A to point B. But uh, yes, we can do that. So they could reach out to you, but that's not a service that's available yet. It will be launched. Yeah, when no, we're fully serviced on six three ratios. We do all of these animal profiles. We we are able to generate today. And what is the cost on that? Do you know? Is that three. Uh, I can I can send proposals out. I don't have my the, the numbers right in front of me. So we offer uh, uh, discounted pricing for for volume. Yep. And people should. Is there a person or just go to audacious.com and it's evident there? Uh, just reach out to me. Here's my email. Okay. I don't think I'll say this to me all the time. The executive director shouldn't be the one getting the in, the inbound emails, but you're pretty good at forwarding. Uh, at, well, I, I actually. Since you said that, there's there's Leah's email. So oh, okay, Leah. it was a like, Leah. I thought when we talked last week, you told me or Leah was the one that was supposed to get yeah. this. So yeah, great, perfect. L dot puro at edacious dot com. All right. Um, uh, Mandy asks, it goes so much further in health, which is why I don't think that there's a lot of science on human health angles, and it'd be very hard study to do ethically and long enough on money. For example, the ADE cakes. Um, what you said is spot on but you can take it further. If the subject has an issue with a gallbladder and bile, then they aren't breaking down their fat properly. So that alone would skew the results. I guess this is just a comment about the, the nuance of, of the human health dynamics and imbalances and imbalances. And yeah. And how do we, how do we try to systematize anything? I mean, the whole concept of saying, you know, all carrots aren't uniform. We're going to build a scale to measure carrots. It's like <laughs> just taking that, that mentality to the next level. So that granted, um, anything you want to say in response to that? No, I think no. she's, she's no. got it there. Yeah. Yeah. But and it was Mandy Ellerton. This, this is a problem, um, with human health studies are just very expensive and it's, it's, it's problematic, but intuitively we also know. And, um, so it's, it's like, you know, we got to ba balance the empirical with the anecdotal a little bit. Yeah. 
and um, Mandy Ellerton was the person whose name you couldn't remember who wrote the paper with with um, David Lazax. So, yeah. Um, okay, Red Heart, is there a readily available way to identify a healthy gut thinking of IDing COVID via sewage? I mean, people are doing that with fecal samples and things. Yeah, you... there's a lot of companies out there now where you can send a, a stool sample in and um, uh, and get um, a, an analysis of your microbiome. Um, the the question this is really interesting question and the question is and this is goes back to Dan and all this work and what is what is nutritious what is the baseline what is a healthy gut actually look like who gets to define what that range is right um, I you know I recently did some human health testing myself or blood testing with a company called Function Health Mark Hyman's company I wanted to see where I was at from a baseline perspective. And like, I'm out of range on like a ton of stuff, but like in a really good way. And I was like, am I out of range or is that like what healthy is supposed to look like? And so, um, and that wasn't universal. I had, you know, things I had to look at, yeah. but, um, it, it just goes to say, it's like, we don't have good baselines. And so if you take something from nature or if you takes, and like we've agriculture, we've been domesticating all these crops for a long time, right? We've been doing breeding and breeding and breeding. And so that we've, we've changed what a baseline actually ever is going to look like. Um, so yeah, I think it, well, I don't know. Do we know what a healthy, healthy microbiome looks like for who? So this is, again, we have a doctor on next week to, I mean, we really haven't touched this side of things at all, but she's, you know, of all the people I've ever met that are doctors that are doing microbiome assessments in your mouth and your, you know, all kinds of parts of your body and <laughs> all kinds of different, you know, nutrient levels in our in your blood and sort of I th we had um david canals on a couple of weeks ago and he was from apical you know reviewing how he's you know take these eight different soil tests this one has this value this one has this value this one has this value we he thinks he knows enough to overlay the insights between them to actually be able to provide some basic guidance but it does require a, a potentially a broad suite of assessments um and i think that's it would make sense to me that that would be, as it seems to be applicable in agriculture, it's also applicable in human health, that we're beginning to get enough data, enough understanding, find enough patterns, that if you are willing to integrate a few different frameworks from your soil or from your body and look for patterns, we'll be able to find the things that are, you know, that, that certain things will jump out. There may be some things that are a bit, a bit nuanced still, but anything you should really be worried about, we can probably find those things pretty rapidly um, with what we already know. But it would take a, a more holistic form of perception. It's not just just your poop. Maybe it's other things also. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, Red Heart says, as you were describing methods of ensuring accurate data sets as the basis for further nutritional correlations, i.e. accurate, reliable live results, it reminded me of the Culling's um, breeding process of developing a new cultivar or breed of animal. I think that was just a comment, but if you have any... Yeah, it, again, it's it's following a scientific process and baselining and tracking change over time um, and having, having all of the attribute data properly classified, right? And this is like where I think we fail is we don't get all the attribute data associated with a sample or associated with something. And so we make generalizations or extrapolations and it's just uh, garbage in, garbage out. But yeah, I think that's a, that was a good observation, Red Heart. Yeah. Um, anonymous attendee has a couple of comments here about grocery stores. I'll just read them and see if you want to comment. Um, I often shop at grocery stores right before closing just for food I can't get from local farms, et cetera. There's always tons of food left, the fruit and veggie sections in particular. Why is there such pressure to keep the shelves so full? Yes, just a few items sold out, but 95% full. What attention is being given to this? I've studied food waste for years. This is rarely mentioned. Um, and clarifying refill grocery stores, it's part of the too much focus on volume of food produced. Reducing this pressure is underappreciated to allow for proper time for research on best practices, details, nutrient density, et cetera. Um, I've also studied and looked at food waste and have made some investments and some grants around the space. It is a complicated problem. Uh, and you're right. The underlying driver is if we're basing, if our system is based on volume as the predictor of success, we're just going to keep producing the wrong volumes and not getting that to the right places. Um, 
So there's estimates that we waste up to a third of food globally, and it's especially bad in this country. Um, just think about the amount of artificial nutrition that we're shipping out of our soils and dumping into our wet landfills. I mean, it is disgusting that we can't figure this out of how to have closed loop systems of moving nutrition back to farms and back to people, um, you know, living systems. The thing that I love about this comment is the food waste problem is directly connected to the nutrient density problem. And um, I locked on this from John Kempf um, and he talked about the mineral richness as a predictor of shelf stability of fruit and veg. And he's onto something big there, which is as we've optimized for bigger and prettier varietals of fruit and veg, what we've done is we've loaded those fruits and veg with carbohydrates. And those carbohydrates are sugars and those sugars are what degrade fast. So microbial activity tends to act upon more moisture, more sugar, and it tends to just create this environment in which that um, those anti-quality factors, bacteria and fungal things that persist, which means food spoils a lot faster. So this relationship between food waste and nutrient density is one that uh, I hope that we're going to start talking about a lot of it, a lot more. Um, and it is also the reason our food tastes less good. So if you're eating like these giant bell peppers that we that we get at the store these days, I, I, like why are we like it doesn't taste like anything. And we're shipping water. We are literally just shipping water from Mexico and California to everywhere else in the country. And it is just, it, it doesn't even, it doesn't even taste good. And so um, not only are we contributing to the food waste problem, we're selling stuff that consumers don't even want, but I buy it. I'm like, ah, green pepper. There it is. Add it to my basket. And I'm just like, why do I buy this? You know, I know better not to buy tomatoes anymore, but like, I still buy that green pepper. And I'm like, <laughs> you know better. Like, yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, yeah, and 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 depending on how it's produced, what making it get so big was lots of free nitrates and potassium chloride and things like that, which even in an organic situation, you know, you can find high levels of these things. And, you know, you can eat your fresh fruits and vegetables to a large degree. It'll give you diarrhea because <laughs> you actually had a bunch of anti-nutrients in it um, because of how we've learned to maximize, maximize you know, sh quantity versus nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got only got a couple minutes left. I think we we touched on the on the topic of a spectrometer, but um, I'd love to I'd love to hear your you know your your considered comments. I mean, I th you know, this is part of what I've been talking about for a very long time. I think it's part of what was why you wanted to start Audacious in the first place. It sounds like you're working on that. You've you've it's but what I hear you saying is it's not part of your short slash medium term um, business plan. But you have looked very deeply into the technical capacity of said, you know, vision. So yeah, it's it's very much part of our us, yeah. it's yeah. it's just um, building novel instrumentation to deploy into the supply chain is not in the short term roadmap, right? So um, the fidelity, and I talked about the what you lose as you miniaturize and focus on cost. And this, you lose a lot of the performance. And so what we recognize with like benchtop spectrometers, we can get a ton of performance and that performance we can better correlate through machine learning to the reference chemical profiles. And so we're doing it. We've developed systems and you should come back in and see everything that we've done. But um, we we need to make sure we can do that before we think about how to deploy it into the food system. So it's very much lab based rather than being supply chain based. And because you haven't done all the big data pattern forming and you haven't overlaid the spectral sets over against the, you know, the chemistry sets, you don't have as much background information now as you would presume to in the future and then be able to build, build meters. Um, I mean, I've talked about their, the potential of there being a, a, a you know, bionutrient meter, a nutrient density meter in your smartphone as one of the cameras. Is that is that plausible? I mean, from everything you understand with with the level of metadata and pattern forming and the capacity of technology, I mean, you, you're you you're you're much closer to the cutting edge on this than yeah. I am on it. So what's, what's it, 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 it's, po eh. so, um, so, 
traditionally hyperspectral is reserved for something that doesn't have like a sample interaction. So you're looking at a distance. So there's something separate from the measurement device and the sample. Mm -hmm. Um, to get today to like get good predictions, you need to be operating in a closed environment where that is that light and that vibration is highly controlled. And so the getting down to a, the ability of a phone to place it on something, activate that light in something and make that sample vibrate, uh, and then capture information is unlikely. So vibrational spectroscopy, I don't think is likely. So hyperspectral, which looks at just color profiles and a range of visible light patterns, I think you could get down to extrapolated relationships. So again, all you need to do is like, let's just use, use a magic number. Like I'm going to run 500 Apple samples through the reference chemistry, 500 Apple samples through the photospectrometers, and then 500 samples through a hyperspectral camera device. Yeah. And then I'm just going to build the reference data sets, um, the, the, the models to try and understand the relationships and the patterns and see what can I predict successfully with that least cost device. Um, and that's, I just gave away how we do our business. So that's, um, anyone can do it. It's just, it's very expensive and time consuming to get all the pieces. And so will a smartphone be able to predict it in the future? What I'm saying is, we will have tools in the supply chain so that there's a label or a sticker that tells you that it's a 98 and you yep. don't need to do that instead. But what you're saying is theoretically, it could just be one of the cameras that currently exists in your phone. It need not be a separate spectrometer because hyperspectral is just regular photography. That's not, that's not spectroscopy. Exactly. So actually, theoretically, it would be just the app, which has your data behind it and, and, and Apple and Samsung wouldn't even need to make a new phone with a new sensor. Theoretically, right? I mean, it's it's as you understand uh, it. I mean, you're 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 doing this day in day day out. You said yeah. the mag the magic words, Dan. It's pattern recognition. So it's can you get enough data out of that image that you can then correlate through deep spectral models back to a reference chemistry set and. Like with something like color, uh, you're going to be able to do that. So you can look at the color of a blueberry, uh, a range of different productions of blueberries, and probably like you did successfully predict antioxidant levels of that blueberry yeah. quickly and cheaply, right? So so yes, it's totally within the realm of possibility. Good. Well, I always like to just verify that. <laughs> Gut check yourself. Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> let everybody who's, who knows more than me t tell me if I'm wrong or not. So <laughs> I can change my change my statements. But cool. Wonderful. Well, this has been a great two hours. Thank you so much. Uh, good luck on Godspeed and, and your work going forward. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, I'm sure we'll I'm sure we'll be collaborating for years. So happy birthday, Dan. Uh, thanks for putting this wonderful conference together. It's been so great watching all the webinars. And uh, yeah, um, I'll see you cool. soon. All right. Great. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye.